What's up, Freedom Church? How are we doing this morning? What's up, Church Online? We're so glad that you'd be joining us, tuning in. We got Carrie joining us in New Hills, North Hills. We got people joining us in Costa Rica. It's about to be a wild Sunday. Are you guys ready? Man, I love that. If we haven't met, like I said, my name's MJ. I'm the youth pastor here. But before we even dive into anything, can you just join me? Let's pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes with me. Jesus, we're grateful for who you are. We're grateful um, for this Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, just being able to remember your outpouring. God, we pray that um, you would be here with us this morning, that we would honor you and we'd experience you in a new, fresh, powerful way. God, we want to experience your, your presence this morning, and it's in your name. Amen. Amen. So there's this idea that's been going through my head over the past week or so as I've been preparing for this message. You know, we've been in this series for the past few weeks called Nothing Wasted. We've been going through the life of Joseph. And so I was sitting there preparing. I was like, okay, we've been going through the life of Joseph. You know, it would probably make sense to keep going through the life of Joseph, keep going through Genesis. And have you guys ever had one of those moments before where something just gets like stuck in your head and you can't get it out? Maybe on your way to church this morning, like you were, you were jamming the radio and like a journey song got stuck in your head. You're like, man, I love the oldies. And now you're sitting here, your foot's still tapping. You can't get it out. Maybe you were sitting at home last night and you got a phone call. And if you're, like, if you're anything like me, I was at my parents' house and my dad's phone call is like a Sasquatch roar stuck in my head. I was like, dude, you're crazy, but the, the sound is stuck. Maybe there's a conversation you had you didn't like the way it ended and the feeling has been stuck and you just can't shake it. Well, I had something like that this week. I was like, man, we're going to talk about the next phase of Joseph's story and I felt like God just like whispered this word. He was like, affliction. I was like, God, a, a flick? A, a what? Shin? Like, I don't even know what that word means. Like, we don't use that word. So I was like, no, that couldn't be from God. We're just going to push that one under the rug. Go back to Genesis and we're going to keep working. Then the next morning I woke up, opened my Bible, started reading the life journal for the day. And believe it or not, it said in the book of Romans, the word affliction. It's like, God, I, I, we're, we're in nothing wasted about Joseph, so we should stick with the plan. We're going to keep going. You know, it's stuck in my head just like that ringtone. Push it away. Next morning, wake up. Life journal again, believe it or not. Affliction, 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 affliction. I was like, all right, God, we're going to go with it. I guess you're in charge. I'm not, so let's sit with it. But if we're going to talk about this idea of affliction in the theme of nothing wasted, it would probably make sense for us to understand what it even means. Because if you're like me... You're like, I've heard that word, maybe I've said that word, but I'm not sure if I really know what it means. It's this idea, it's a word that we tend to kind of combine with other things. So it's like, oh, my affliction in my life is, it's my trauma, it's my consequence of sin, it's all these things. But believe it or not, this is a big theme when God's talking to his people. This word affliction is used over 45 times in the Bible, and so I think it's important to God, so it should be important to us to understand what it means. And so it's this Greek word in the original language called thlipsis. You wanna go home and tell your friend something cool, you can be like, yo, thlipsis, you got it in your life. But this word means, <laughs> it's a compression caused by an outside force, a painful pressure, or a pressing down upon by something else. A painful pressure, a compression caused by an outside force. And this definition got me thinking that affliction in our life is kind of a lot like, like this. This is our life. We are inside the world. We're living in the world. We're walking through the day-to-day -day life. And then all of a sudden, we experience financial affliction. Things aren't working out the way they're supposed to. And it's like the world grabs us and just starts shaking and compressing us. And the pressure begins to build inside of our life. And then maybe the next day we wake up and we go to work and we get in a fight with Peggy and she's just going at us for nothing we even did. And you're sitting there ready to rip your hair out because the pressure is building and it's like somebody has grabbed your life by the neck and has just begun to compress and shake and build pressure and you're sitting there like, I don't know how much longer I can take this before I explode. The pressure is building. It's becoming strenuous. Maybe, like I said, maybe it's financial. Maybe, maybe your health has been declining recently and you feel like the world is just compressing you and pressurizing your life and you're waiting for the lid to blow open 
where you can't even control it anymore. Maybe it's relational. Maybe you just lost a friend or somebody betrayed you or crossed your back or spreading lies and rumors about your life and you're sitting here dealing with the compression of it. You're dealing with the pressing of it. You're sitting there feeling the pressure, weighed down by the pressing down like the Bible says with this idea of affliction and we're sitting here afflicted, compressed, and pressed down upon, waiting to explode. And it's like we're just sitting in our life every day being shaken and shaken and shaken. And you probably don't want me to open this on you right now, right? Because what would happen? It would be a mess. It would feel impossible to get all the pieces back inside. You'd be stuck cleaning up the mess, embarrassed by what's happening around you. All attention's on you because your affliction has led to an implosion. And I think this is what is happening in all of our lives because what struck me about this idea of affliction over and over and over again in the Bible with this theme is that affliction is not necessarily something we deal with as a consequence of our failure. Affliction is not an if. It's not like, man, I'm going to live my life and follow the rules and honor God and obey him. I'm going to show up to church. I'm going to serve in the kids' ministry. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to do all the things. I'm going to do them all well. And then the affliction will stay away. The shaking will cease. The pressure will stop building. Yet when we look at the life of Joseph as we've been walking through for the past seven or eight weeks, this idea we've been saying, hey, nothing's wasted. God can use everything. And we're sitting here with this affliction that is compressing us and shaking us and rattling us. One of the other words that it uses is tribulation, a shaking. And we sit here and we go, man, I can't get it to stop shaking. I can't walk through it. I don't even know what to do. And it reminds me of Joseph's life. There's two words when I look at everything we've walked through for the past few weeks. Two words that identify the life of Joseph. And the first one was Joseph lived a life of affliction. Over and over and over again, story after story, season after season, year after year, the world didn't stop shaking Joseph. The pressure didn't stop coming down. The walls didn't stop closing in. And it blows my mind because as I sit here and I look at the things that Joseph went through, Genesis 37, it says when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off his beautiful robe he was wearing, grabbed him and threw him into a ditch. Joseph didn't do anything. He honored his father. He worked hard. He honored God with his life. And he's beaten. The pressure is coming down. He honors God. He serves God. He does everything right. Genesis 37, his brothers don't just beat him. They sell him into slavery. They say, you're no longer identified with our family name. We're going to strip away your identity. Your good is nothing. How's that for some affliction? Genesis 39, Joseph doesn't just get beaten. Joseph doesn't just get sold. Joseph is now in a situation where he's falsely accused of something shameful that would derail the rest of his life. It says, she called out to her servants. Soon all the men came running. Look, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave, Joseph, here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. Joseph is now falsely accused. And it's like I can imagine sitting in Joseph's shoes. It feels like the walls are just closing. And Joseph, that nothing, none of the affliction is a byproduct of Joseph's failures. He's living in a broken world where affliction is not an if, it's a when. Yet we're talking about nothing wasted. If affliction is going to be a part of my life regardless, how can I not waste it? How can I let it not get the best of me? If I can't always control it, Joseph couldn't control that he was beaten. Joseph couldn't control that he was sold. Joseph couldn't control the accusations that came out of somebody's mouth. Sometimes we can't control the diagnosis the doctor gives us. We can't control the words that a friend is going to say behind our back. We can't control the unexpected financial hardships that come our way. So how do we live like Joseph and not let it 
destroy us. Because when I see Joseph over and over, affliction comes, yet Joseph will rise again. Affliction comes, Joseph will rise again. I want my life to be like Joseph. I don't want afflictions to destroy me. I don't want the pressure and the compression to cause me to explode. And just like this can, I think a lot of us are sitting here in the middle of this affliction this morning, and we feel like we're ready to explode, and it's just like if I started to, like the pressure's in there. One false move, and this thing explodes, and that's like our cry to God. God, the pressure has built. I need help. I can't get out. And this is the encouragement he wants to give us this morning that we're going to dive into. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, We've been pressed on every side by our troubles. That sounds a lot like the idea of affliction, that we would be compressed and painfully pressed by an outside source. God is acknowledging the pain that we're walking in. He says, hey, I see that you've been pressed on every side by your troubles, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Before we even dive into anything this morning, I want you to understand whatever painful pressure you're walking in, whatever affliction has overwhelmed you, there is a God whose love is bigger than it, and he says, I want to rescue in the midst of your affliction. God saw Joseph when he was beaten by his brothers. God saw Joseph when he was in the ditch. God was with Joseph when he was sold into slavery. God saw Joseph when his life was thrown into shame by an accusation. He said this. This is what the Bible says. Every time affliction comes Joseph's way, the Lord was near to Joseph. I don't know who needs to hear it this morning, but whatever affliction you're walking through, the Lord is with you in it. He says, I have not abandoned you through it. You are not lost to the world. Your affliction does not need to be the final say, I'm with you in it. And I sit here still looking through Joseph's life as we're ready to explode. And Joseph, I have to imagine, was ready to explode. What begins to happen when the affliction hits? Because we have to have a response. And it makes me think of when I was 18 years old, I moved to this city in the middle of nowhere in Missouri called Joplin, Missouri. If you're looking for a vacation spot, highly don't recommend it. Go somewhere else. And so me and my family, are, we're, we packed up my truck. I put everything that was inside of my, tr- of, of my house in my truck. We drive across the country. We get onto this campus, literally in the middle of nowhere. And I was like, wow, man, this is what the God has for me, right? This is crazy. And so we move into the dorm. I'm having a great time meeting new friends. My mom's crying her eyes out because this is, this is her affliction. She's like, the pressure, the world's killing me. I'm losing my son. And I was like, this is about to be great. Her affliction was not mine. <laughs> and I remember sitting on day two of college, and they called like a student campus-wide chapel. And we're sitting in these chairs just like you are right now. And the president of the campus is speaking to us, welcoming us to school. And then they start to pass out these little paper glasses that look like they belong in a cereal box, like wrapped in clear plastic, the cheapest thing you've ever seen in the world. And I was like, wait, did I, did I miss something on the registration option? Like, what are the glasses for? And I, I, I'm not too up to date with all these science things. And I missed the fact there was a natural phenomenon that was about to take place this day called a solar eclipse. So they're handing out these glasses and everybody goes outside and is sitting on the soccer field and we're looking up into the sky when all of a sudden the moon begins to pass over the sun and everything begins to get dark and we can't see things. I I knew where the cafeteria was 30 seconds ago, but now I can't see it. I knew what path to walk on 30 seconds ago to get where I was, but now I'm sitting there with these glasses, taking them on and off, trying to see what's around me, and everything is different. Everything is blurred. Everything is shadowed. You see, what an eclipse is, an eclipse is an overshadowing, an overcoming, or a powerful covering. MJ, why are you telling us about an eclipse in Joplin, Missouri? Because I think what begins to happen in our life, when we see Joseph's life and we look at our own life, is that if we're not careful, when affliction strikes, our afflictions can eclipse our life. 
when, when, when things go wrong, do you begin to feel overcome? When the finances aren't working, do you feel like an overshadowing has taken place and you don't know what to do? All of a sudden, here's what happens when our life becomes eclipsed by affliction. Affliction causes a loss of perception. I'm standing in this field in Missouri and I can't see the way that I normally can. I don't know where to go. I'm not sure where to walk. Things look different than they usually do. And when we're in the middle of our affliction, when I look at Joseph's life, when I look at my own life and my own struggles, my own compression, and I look at yours, the first response to affliction is that it eclipses our life. It gets in the way and all of a sudden things start to get really dark. And we lose perception. We lose perception of how to take another step. We lose perception of where and who God is. We start to ask ourselves these questions because our life is being eclipsed. There's an overshadowing. And we start to say things like, how could a good God allow me to be walking through something like this? If God is real and God is good, why am I beaten in a ditch by my family? If God is so good and he's with me, why do the afflictions continue? Why am I falsely accused? Why am I beaten? Why am I imprisoned? Why am I sold? Because affliction causes us a loss of perception that causes us to sit stuck, unable to see, nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. Am I the only one in the room who can relate to this idea of, man, sometimes when life gets crazy, it's like there's this thick eclipse that takes place where I don't know where to walk. I lose sight of who God is, but this is the truth you need to be reminded of in the midst of that affliction, that while God is not the cause of your affliction, he can use it for his good. He can use it for your good. He can use it for the good of others. I think if you ask Joseph every time the affliction struck, in the moment, he probably had a loss of perception where he was like, I don't even know how I'm going to get out of this situation. Yet on the end of the story, he would say, I know that my God was working through the pressures of the world to strengthen me and to bring people to him. Anybody in the room want your afflictions to not go to waste? Are you saying, I've been walking through struggles, I've been broken, I've been beaten, I've been cast out, but I don't want that to be who I am. Because here's the second thing that happens. Affliction doesn't just cause us a loss of perception. Affliction becomes our identification. All of a sudden, you're just a, a cancer patient. All of a sudden, you're just somebody who doesn't know how to manage finances. All of a sudden, your identification is just the single mom. All of a sudden, your identification becomes founded on what tried to compress you. When we let our life become eclipsed and overshadowed by the pressure of the world, we don't just lose focus of what to do, we lose focus of who we are. And we find ourselves sitting in the bottom of the pit, and it feels impossible for it to not become wasted because it's who we are. How can you escape something that's not a situation, it's an identity? And I struggle with this because I sit here and I see the story. And what begins to happen is affliction has a way of dominating our field of view. It becomes the biggest thing. It blocks out everything else and we lose perception. We lose identity. We lose everything. And now we're sitting alone, shaken, waiting to explode. Yet the thing that drives me crazy about this story and everything that we've walked through is in the midst of the worst afflictions I can imagine, Joseph never lost perception of his God. In the midst of the affliction, in the midst of the beatings, in the midst of the false claims, in the midst of the slavery, in the midst of all of the worst things the world has to offer, he doesn't lose sight of his mission, he doesn't lose sight of his God, and he doesn't lose sight of his identity. And so then we sit and we look on the backside of this and we go, okay, so why was it that somehow Joseph's afflictions were never wasted? How is it that the afflictions and the pressures and the pains of the world didn't get the best of Joseph? 
because I don't want it to be me. I want my afflictions to have to surrender. I don't want them to become my identification. Here's the second thing that happens with affliction. Affliction will either eclipse your life or just like Joseph, this is what I've learned, your afflictions become eclipsed by God's glory. I want to say that again. Your life will either become eclipsed by your afflictions and you'll lose focus of your life, you'll lose focus of your dreams, you'll lose, you'll lose your vision, you'll lose your passion, you'll lose it all and you'll lose your identification. Or you will understand that just like this, the moon does not remain in front of the sun because there's a stronger gravitational force at work, your affliction does not have to remain in the forefront of your life because there's a stronger presence in this world. His name is Jesus and his glory has the power to eclipse whatever the world has pressured you into. This is the story of Joseph. Every time affliction strikes, I told you at the beginning that there was two words that sum up the life of Joseph, affliction and glory. Affliction rises. Joseph does not fall. Joseph runs to the presence of his God and says, I know that you won't waste it. And Joseph is promoted to something new. Joseph is built. Joseph is strengthened. What if you're sitting in the midst of your affliction and Jesus is looking at you and he's saying, I didn't create it. It's not what I would have said is best for you. But what if it could become eclipsed by something bigger than even you? What if God's glory was actually this antidote that instead of our afflictions causing us a loss of perception, it gave us greater clarity of vision? It allowed us to see God working. It allowed us to see the purpose that we fit into. Nothing wasted. Your afflictions don't have to be what destroy you. They can actually be what redeem you, restore you, and reclarify you. It will give you greater vision. And the glory of God will re-identify you, not give you the identification of the world. You are not identified by the failure. and You're not identified by the diagnosis. You're not identified by the things that others have done to you, out of your control, that have broke you, left, left in you feeling twisted. Jesus looks at you in the midst of his grace and he says, when you allow me to enter the equation, your identity goes from what was breaking you to who redeemed you. What sounds better, an identity of pain or an identity as the son or the daughter of the king who gets to walk in the kingdom, who get the vision of where he's going and what he's doing, where he's saying, I didn't create you to be overcome by affliction, but I saw you in the midst of it, and my glory can reign through it. Your life can be eclipsed by affliction, or we can run to Jesus in the midst of it and let his glory be the dominant power in our life. Because when we praise Jesus, the atmosphere changes. When Joseph praised Jesus, it said the Lord was with him. And when he, the Lord is with you, you can't be beaten. Because he already won. He's already the victor. In the Bible, it says you will become more than conquerors. You will become victorious. You will share in his victory. Because your afflictions were not meant to conquer you. His glory was meant to rescue you. It's a switch of perspective. You can walk through your life blinded and eclipsed by your pain, or you can be set free by the power of his glory. Yeah. I want to I read this to you as we begin to wrap this up. Romans 12, 12, because I still sit here and I see Joseph's life and I go, man, that sounds real good. But in the midst of my afflictions, how do I get myself there? Because it's easy to quit. It's easy to roll over. It's easy to let that loss of perception become permanent. So what does Joseph do? How can we be encouraged? What's your steps? Romans 12, 12, Paul is talking to the church in Rome, an afflicted church just like us, burdened and broken and beaten. And this is what he says. Rejoice in your confident hope, be patient in times of trouble, and keep on praying. When was the last time in the middle of the pressure, in the middle of the compression? in the middle of the struggle, that instead of complaints and regrets and words of harm come out of our mouth, we stopped and raised a hand and said, I wanna rejoice in the midst of it. Amen. It's not natural. It doesn't make sense. Yet when Jesus shows up, a lot of the times he says, I wanna flip the script because I know what's best, not you. What if in the moments of pain, you didn't have to wait until the healing to rejoice. You could rejoice knowing that there's a God who's capable of the healing. You could rejoice knowing that there's a God who's capable of restoration. 
You could rejoice knowing that there's a glory that can outweigh your shame and your pain and the things that have been done to you and the identity that the world has tried to put on you, that you could run to Jesus and say, I actually understand. I can rejoice in the face of affliction, because, not because of who I am or what I'm capable of, but because of what my God has already done and I'm invited to be a part of it. What if we started rejoicing? What if we started actually lifting hands and praising in the middle of the storm because we knew that there was something that could eclipse it? I want to finish with this story to show you what this means because it's a lot easier said than done. It's a lot easier to tell you to rejoice in your affliction than to actually rejoice in it. It reminds me of my friend. I have a family friend. Her name is Ty. And Ty's gone through one of the greatest afflictions I've ever seen and I could even imagine about 15 or 18 years ago or so, Ty got a phone call that her young adult son, college basketball player, dreams and aspirations ahead of him, was riding his motorcycle home from work when he was struck by a drunk driver who hit and ran. And I'm sure you could imagine the pressure that began to build, hearing the words you need to get here as soon as possible because your son's probably not going to make it. You need to get here and be prepared to say your goodbyes. I think I've gone through afflictions in my life, but I hear stories like ties. And I hear about a woman who's getting ready to lose literally everything in the snap of her fingers at no fault of her son. Just like Joseph. Believe it or not, his name's Joseph. And in the midst of the heaviest affliction she could possibly imagine, she could have yelled at God, how could you? Where were you? You're supposed to be there for him. He wasn't doing anything wrong. She could have yelled at God. She could have turned on God. She could have ran. She could have given up hope. Yet on day number one in the hospital, Ty wasn't complaining. She wasn't screaming. Ty was in the hospital right next to her son who was getting ready to die with her hands raised saying, God, I know that you're here. I know that you're real. And regardless of what happens through it, God, I need you to use this. One year goes by. Joseph's in a coma, no signs of life, no signs of progress, nothing. Two years go by, three years go by, four years go by, five years go by. It's been 15 years. And what I love about this story is in a moment of affliction when Ty's life could have become eclipsed by the tragedy of her son. She could have lost perception of her life. She could have lost focus of God. She could have turned, lost perception, become identified as the mom with a comatose son identified as the mom who lost everything, identified by all of the pain and all of the hurt. Ty said, I wanna rejoice because I know who my God is. What does Romans say? It says, be patient in trouble. That's this picture. It's not saying just sit around and wait. God is saying, take a stance of offense. Stand firm. Don't recede. Don't be pushed back. She took a stance of offense in the face of trial and said, I wanna rejoice of who my God is. I wanna stand firm in the face of what the devil meant to destroy me. And I wanna seek the presence of my God. What if I told you that in the face of what should have afflicted her life, she surrendered to the glory of God and said, God, I need your glory to eclipse my situation because you're bigger, you're more powerful. What if in the last 15 years, I told you almost 60 people have come to know Jesus because Ty said, I'm gonna rejoice in the suffering. I'm gonna stand firm and fight in the face of what the enemy meant to destroy me. I'm gonna seek his presence. I'm gonna gather people around me. Time after time after time. Joseph's still laying in a bed. He hasn't woken up. But Ty's life is not fixed on the affliction. And what I love the most is we've seen God move in crazy ways. Miracle after miracle after miracle. Doctors saying this doesn't make sense. He should have died last year. He should have died this year. He should have died so many times. Yet Ty said, I want to rejoice because I know what my God has already done. I want to rejoice because I know what he's capable of. I want to rejoice because my affliction is not my identity. My affliction is not, what I, is not who I am. 
but the glory of God is an invitation to walk in what we can't understand and what we don't know. If you'll stand your feet around the room. One of my favorite verses in this entire story, Joseph has been beaten, Joseph's been sold, Joseph's been accused, Joseph lost everything. And then we get to the end of the story and in the face of his afflictors, the ones who caused the pain, the ones who brought the affliction, he says, you meant to defeat me. You meant to destroy me. Is there anybody in the room who's in the face of affliction? You feel like, man, I feel like it's meant to destroy me. I feel like it's defeating me. I feel like I'm gonna lose this battle. But the next words out of Joseph's mouth is he said, you meant to destroy me, but my God meant it for the saving of many people. My God meant it for the saving of many people. What if God is looking at you in the middle of your affliction, in the middle of Ty's affliction, in the middle of my affliction, and he's saying, I didn't create it, but I'm capable of using it. I didn't create it, but I wanna strengthen you through it. I didn't cause it, but I wanna use your affliction to set others free. In the same way that Ty has brought over 60 people to know saving grace in Jesus, because she said, I wanna rejoice through it, I wanna stand firm in it, and I wanna turn to God for it. Everything in her life began to change. What if I could ask you this simple question this morning? Are you sitting, have you receded in the midst of your affliction? Have you complained your way through your loss? And have you turned to your problems to try to find answers for the holes in your life? What if today could be the day where you said, it might not quite make sense, but I wanna raise my hand and rejoice in it because I trust that there's a God who can work through it. I don't wanna be identified by what's happened to me. I don't wanna be identified by the failures that have happened in my life. I wanna submit and surrender to a God whose glory is bigger than the affliction. In the same way the sun moves the moon, God's glory can move your pain, move your affliction, move your, move it all. And that's why I love in 2 Corinthians, we started with this, it says, we've been pressed on every side by troubles. This is a room full of people who've been pressed on every side by troubles, but we won't be defeated. Why? Because there's a glory that's bigger than what we're walking in. And his name is Jesus and he's invited you to be a part of it. If you're standing in this room this morning and you're saying, man, my life has been identified by an eclipse, by affliction. I want to get my vision back. I want a new identity. Well, Jesus is calling this morning. He says, all of you have sinned. You've all fallen short. You've all been broken. That's why we're in this mess. But when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the grave, you will be saved. The glory will eclipse your affliction. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I wanna ask you this question this morning. Are you ready to repent and turn from the wickedness of the world, the affliction of your life and the sin that has overwhelmed you and run to the glory of God and say, I want a new identity as a son. I wanna be saved, I wanna be restored, I wanna be redeemed, I wanna be rebuilt. I wanna be like Joseph, we're in the midst of my affliction, your word says that you're near to me. God, I need you to be near to me. On the count of three, would you shoot your hand in the air and say, man, I wanna repent and I wanna run to Jesus. Three, Jesus has made a way for you through the cross. Two, your afflictions do not have to permanently eclipse your life. One, shoot your hand in the air if you'll say, I wanna be identified as a son of Jesus. I see your hand in the back. I see you, I see you, I see you. We see your hand, we see you. We see you right there, we see you, we're with you. We're with you, we're with you. We're with you in the back. We're with you back there, because here's the deal. When we run to Jesus, when we rejoice in the midst of the trial, when we stand firm even though it doesn't make sense and we praise Jesus, His glory enters the room and things begin to change. So come on, let's rejoice together. Get a little uncomfortable. Raise a hand to heaven. Say, I want to rejoice in the midst of it. I want to worship Him through it. I want to stand firm because His glory is eclipsing my affliction. Come on, let's worship this morning. So incredible, people making that first time decision for Jesus. Can we celebrate that together? If you made that decision and you're in this room or you're online, if you're online, you can type, I believe, in the chat bar. Uh, I just want to encourage you. Following Jesus, I promise you, I think sometimes we have um, a skewed perspective or we've heard something that when you start following Jesus, 
uh, it's all sunshines and rainbows, but MJ did an incredible job today telling us that it's not that. We will, we will encounter afflictions. We will encounter, but the best news, the good news is that Jesus will be with you in every season of your life. He joins you uh, where you're at. So if you made that decision, incredible. If I could encourage you, I've been following Jesus a very long time now. And uh, doing it alone is not the way God intended it to, to be. And so you can make that decision. You can encounter the presence of God. But if you just walk out, you're like, that was cool. You need someone to remind you tomorrow, hey, remember that decision you made? God is with you. He's for you because the enemy is going to lie to you the moment you walk out of this, this building. And so uh, we have people that would love to pray with you, that would love to get a Bible in your hands. Same is true online. You can just let them know in the chats. Our prayer team will reach out to you. Um, but tell someone, don't just walk out of here and let that moment pass. Agree with someone, let them know what's going on inside and what Jesus is doing in you. We've got growth track happening right after service if you're looking for a next step. But Freedom Church, we love you so much. I pray just as we celebrated Pentecost Sunday today, the people that encountered the Holy Spirit had this ability to proclaim the gospel. And so I pray as we leave this place today, the spaces that you are in, your work, your home, your neighbors, your friends, that you feel an empowerment from God himself to proclaim the good news everywhere you go. We love you, Freedom Church, and we will see you next week. <laughs>